Hi, everybody. Hi, Principal Welcome Zabur. to the songwriters panel, songwriting panel. Um, so, <laughs> who likes songs? Who likes songs? Who here likes songs and who here likes writing? Well, it turns out you can combine those two interests, Reese's Peanut Butter Cup-like. Uh, I am an ill-prepared moderator because I figured everybody's smart and interesting, and we're going to throw to questions very early. But first, just to throw, uh, throw something out there, because uh, we have a combination of writing styles and combinations here on the stage. We have a number of duos, member of a trio, some individual artists, and an artist who does not write lyrics. <laughs> uh, and it, it, while it's a cliched question to ask about what your process is, um, or, uh, so uh, actually, go quickly introduce yourself. We're Paul and Storm. Hi, you know us. I'm Ben from Jukebox the Ghost. Yeah. That's such a great response. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm Dessa. John Colton from Joko Cruise. <laughs> and uh, I'm Zoe Keating from Zoe Keating. Yeah. I'm going to start this question with Ben. Storm and I are a songwriting duo. And our process is pretty collaborative, although you know, usually one of us brings in at least the kernel of an idea, but very quickly, usually over Google Docs, since we live in two different places, it's sort of a collaborative thing. Sometimes we're on the phone with each other, sometimes just typing at each other. For you guys, I know there are multiple songwriters in the group, are, is it sort of a Lennon McCartney kind of mishmash? You each bring in your own thing and tweak it? How, do, how does your process work generally? Yeah, I think uh, so. There's, there's. Uh, we all, we all write. There's three members in our, our band: drums. Uh, Tommy does guitar and sings, and I do piano and sing, and blah blah blah. But um, we sort of each will start with our own idea, and I think usually try to get it as far along as we can, so that when we bring it into the band, it's a easier sell. You know, because otherwise, you bring in, hey, I have this great lyric idea and someone else has a fully fledged song, there's no way that that lyric is ever gonna see the light of day. Um, so yeah, I, I, and each song, you know, sometimes you bring it in and, and you've, you know, I've worked on it, worked on it, and then the, the guys get there and, and then completely fix it and change it and I get angry and we fuss. <laughs> and, and it usually ends up being a lot better than I, in my brain the perfection uh, was or was not. Um, but sort of every song, every song is different. Every song yeah. has its own weird path. Do you generally, is there, is it generally lyric first or music first, or is it? I mean, obviously, it will depend on the song. But is there a, I, one more than the other? I, I'm, a music, I'm a music first person. Uh -huh. I, like a, a classical piano background. Like I live there and then try to find the song. And then Tommy is usually lyric and concept first. So that's sort of how we end up meeting in the middle. And uh, Zoe, lyric or music first? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of your writing process yeah. as well, given that you are a solo artist and yeah. working and looping. Do you what? Where's the core for your Actually, songs come there, from? To the extent there's a pattern. There are words for my songs, but only I know them. Uh, <laughs> are they in a secret language? <laughs> Uh, well, no, no, they, they are actually in English, and some songs are based on sort of a phrase that I have in my head, and. Um, and I might actually be sort of singing that phrase as I'm playing, so it's like a secret extra lyric, you know, that doesn't exist. Um, and then other ones, um, you know, I uh, I know that they don't have words, but for me, they definitely have words. You know, even even if they're not words, words, they're they're music. And um, I have I think <laughs> the words are just in musical form. You know. What? <laughs> what does that mean? I want to be in your brain. What does that mean? Well, like, um, I'm going to have a song called Sun Will Set, and uh, for me that has very specific words, but they're just musical words, you know, the words are the, the music is the words. And I always write everything in song format, like, just like everybody else, but, um, and I write the chorus first, and then I write backwards from there to create the song out of the chorus. So. Do you have like an actual vocabulary, like from one song to another? Will you have like a? No, no, it's unique. It's unique to the song. So yeah. there's like a, a sugar roast kind of thing where it's sort of <laughs> not quite word words, or there are actual kind of. There words? are actually words, yeah, and and they're very personal, and so I, I don't usually share those. In fact, I never share those with anyone except you know. Share them with our audience right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just write them down. We'll put them on the screen. 
<laughs> yeah. And sometimes I feel like, you know, I'm always slightly worried that somebody might learn what the words are for my song, the secret words, and so I will, in that case, give it a title that is a red herring. Ooh. Ooh. So is it like a Rumpelstiltskin thing? If someone guessed the name, you could never do that song again. <laughs> Probably, that's so never happened. If they can name yeah. the song. The Luckily, tree. Elon Musk's thing to like read your minds is not a thing yet. Right. Because as soon as that happens, I won't be able to perform. Uh oh. <laughs> that, that's why you will never allow Elon Musk to attend one of your concerts. No. No. Uh, and Dessa, again, to ask the overly broad question for you, is it? Uh, you know, is, do you have sort of a core concept, or do you lyrics first versus music? Where, where, where do your songs usually come from to the extent that there's a pattern? Um, I would say that you know, when I started in, in music, it was essentially as, like a, as a failed writer who'd been trying to get published for a long time, couldn't get a deal, and a friend of mine suggested that I try slam poetry, and from there I met a bunch of rappers. And um, rap works, I sometimes describe it as kind of like Legos, it's a very modular writing form usually. So you, know, you would ask, for, like if we were all going to do a show and there was a beat on, somebody would say, who's got 16s? So you can kind of snap a verse, you know, over any beat in a reasonably BPM range, um, you know, beats per minute range at a reasonable tempo. And so usually in, in rap music, it's very much like your job is the writer or your job is the beat maker. And even if you do both roles, you don't do them at the same time, you know? And in a collaborative way, it's really easy in that uh, you can meet someone for the first time on stage and really quickly generate a song together by saying, I need something at about 70 BPM, and then we'll just do verse passes. Mm -hmm. Somebody got a chorus, can you teach it to us? We can all do the chorus together. Um, so that was how I learned, which is kind of in 16 are in chunks like that, but when I started, as is the case for a lot of rappers, I think like, I didn't know what a bar was, um, I didn't know what a measure was, or a snare, and so I was hiding that, <laughs> because I didn't want to, you know, reveal my ignorance, um, and so a lot of us, I think, at the beginning, were writing like, hot 17 and a half bar verses, <laughs> there was a lot of like, yo, yo, <laughs> reverse, until the one came around. Now, um, as a, as you know, now that I have a role in music, but I would say that I'm also like aware of what I think my strengths are and what my, um, what my weaknesses are. Like you know, the people with whom I collaborate are better at um, writing percussion than I am. I just don't have a natural gift for that, at least not when I've developed. Um, but yeah, for me, I would say words and concept are, are almost almost always. Right. I, uh, oh, go ahead. I have a question oh. for Paul and Storm. Yes. Um, so, in your songs, um, do you uh, tend to divide like somebody does music more than lyrics, or do you do you do it evenly, or one? Can you can, can your fans identify? Oh, that's a Storm song, or that's a Paul song. Like, that's a very good question that I'm not sure. I, for, to my mind, it tends to be kind of a mishmash anymore. Like, I think Storm probably. I mean, Storm's the one who plays an instrument consistently. Yeah. I'm a terrible keyboard player, and that's the ex I play trumpet. I played trumpet for 12 years, but that's not great for performing and singing. Um, so I, you know, I will come at things melodically. I like to think I have a pretty good ear for a melody and a, and a hook and such. Not that Storm doesn't, but I, I, you know, far more so than the sort of underlying chord structure. I'll hear something, but I can't verbalize it, or if I plunk away long enough at a piano, I can plug it out, but Storm's certainly much more adept at sort of hearing mm -hmm. how, a, how an actual arrangement can go. Oh yeah, like like chord changes uh, come very easily in hooks and things like that. And I naturally uh, tend towards the music more. I'll say if something is outrageously funny, it's more likely to be Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I get mine in there too, uh, but definitely we there. It's mishmash. Yeah, we're. A, I mean, obviously, we're being especially sort of a comedy music act for the most part. Uh, the, the metaphor I always use in my own brain for how I construct songs, especially lyrics, is it's part part sculpture and part jigsaw puzzle. Like, you know, you got the big piece of marble and you chip away all the pieces that aren't the horse. So, you know, I'll often sort of know the shape of the song. Like, it's got to do this kind of thing story-wise or joke-wise here, and then it's got to do this by the bridge. But then, as you start to chip away the pieces, and, and you know, I, I guess I think of you know, rhymes and words as these puzzle pieces that I get to play around with. And oh, I found this one, but that means. But it's so it's the shitty puzzles that are like they're all the same shape, and you got to find the ones that fit together right, not just the ones that fit together. 
and it's, it's heartbreaking when you find this awesome, awesome rhyme, and but it just doesn't work with mm -hmm. the feel because you have to worry about the rhythms mm -hmm. and timing of not just the the uh, well, the rhythms and timing and the changes, but also the rhythms and timing timing of the comedy. Well, I think I just want sorry that I just want my my son experienced your concert for the first time. I like that you put it as Ooh. experienced. <laughs> <laughs> he experienced it a lot. Yeah, yeah. He and, really uh, and and we were talking about it afterwards and said not only do you have to write the music and the lyrics but the jokes. And when is the reveal of the joke? That's so anyway. That's the magic. Part. That's what makes us the awesome comedy musicians that we are. Uh, but it is actually you know, we. It's interesting, the timing of a, a musical joke is different than the timing of just regular jokes. We, over the course of our career, have played a number of comedy clubs. And it's weird and difficult because a comedy club is expecting a very specific pace of stand-up. And then we come up there and it's just by nature of the music. And certainly if you want to make the music good quality music that you can listen to more than once, when it's not solely about the joke, the pacing is more slack than that. And, but finding that balance is always really difficult. And one way or the other. Jonathan knows. Jonathan writes funny songs. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Yeah, no, it's true. The, and I've, I've had the same experience with comedy, a comedy context coming up there and doing a song, and it's like, you know, there's not a, there's only a couple of jokes in the song, and it takes a while to get to them. And for me, for me, I think that, you know, to do comedy music, you need to have uh, music and solid songwriting behind it. Like, I don't, I don't like music comedy music that does not also work as a piece of music. Yeah. A song. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, like I always I always could not stand a Adam Sandler's shtick because it's it's kind of like, you know, it's much more on the comedian end of things. Yeah. And it's like, you know, that could be that could be that also could be a great song if you worked on it a little harder. <laughs> uh, and Hong Kong Splat. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Hong Kong Splat, exactly. And, uh, that's one of the things I love both about Dess's music and Jukebox the Ghost. It's the kind of music I'm drawn to. It's not comedy music by any stretch, but there's a lot of humor there's and humor smartness in there, in there that it, it draws you in. Brain. Yeah, tickles your brain, and, and you know, I appreciate that. Yeah. Is, are you, is that a conscious thing, or is you sort of your personality coming to the work? Are you like, this song should be funnier. I can like, get something a little more amusing in here, or clever. I mean, clever is a terrible word. But. No, but you do want to have it be interesting. I always want it to be like musically interesting. I want it to be able to stand, the song to stand on its own, the chords to be interesting, whatever, and then play musical jokes. I love a build-up that doesn't land, or a chord that's unpredictable, or a change that do modulation. Great. Love a modulation, we love a key change. Writing songs in keys that I can't sing, so then we have to drop it down after we record it to sing it live. <laughs> that's just a joke. It was. Um, and then, you know, writing songs that might seem one way in terms of like the musical tone and the energy, and then you get into the lyrics and it's dark or subversive or angry or whatever it happens to be, and playing with those sorts of expectations so that when you actually dig into it, there's more than just a pop song. Because when you work in the pop song, world, whether it's comedy or rap or whatever, there's a formula and there are things that you sort of have to tick off that then you want a little more substance to it. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to, I just have so many questions. It's like, maybe I should just ask you all later instead of asking you. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, if, if any of you do have questions, we have a microphone down here. We're going to throw the questions very soon. Or if you have any mobility issues, just raise your hand and we'll make sure it gets brought to you. But uh, one, yeah, if you've got another one, well, fire I'm, away. I was wondering, this is a question for all of you. Um, say you, you know, you've You've written your perfect song, you're ready to go perform it, and you get up there and you've... Do you feel it... Is there ever been a time you feel it just doesn't work in front of the audience? And then, you, and then do you go back and change it? What do you do then? Do you ditch it? Like, has that happened? You know, that was sort of my question. And, and um, I wanted to ask that first to Dessa. Um, like, I love the way when you were performing, you sort of would step aside and step out of the song and talk to the audience. And I was wondering if that came as part of the song or as a performer or... There was a lot of questions in there. <laughs> I mean, I think like when you guys were talking about, you know, c comedic or songwriting with a comedic element, like, I haven't, I've just, I've got maybe three songs that are funny or that are intentionally funny. Um, and I think I've always been like leaned pretty f hard into like, existential, sad girl, literary, feminist, hip-hop, and then to maybe offset that, I, had, I was getting like increasingly goofy banter, 
you know? But then I thought at times people would meet me and were surprised that I wasn't like really goth or really sad all the time, if you just listen to the recorded stuff. Um, but I was like listening to you guys, I'm so uh, just like viscerally jealous because mine is quantized, yeah. which is the, is, it's like inoculates a joke against itself, you know? It's like, um, it prevents you essentially meaning that the tempo is unchanging, right? Because I'm working with uh, electronically produced music almost all the time, as opposed to like that great fluidity when something's working, you know, and somebody throws a masked pair of underwear at you. Like you can <laughs> milk that moment for all the So he so gets that line. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I think the banter for me was also just like um, maybe a product of asthma in that um, in hip hop you dance and we would just pogo the whole show, but I can't pogo the whole show and, and also be a musician. It's kind of one or the other. And so I learned, I think, to do a lot of bodily stuff to look like I was still moving. It was like, I'm a laser pointer too, you know what I mean, with the cat, because I can't jump with the guys who, are, who don't have pitch responsibilities. They have rap responsibilities, but they don't you know, have to worry about like, their larynx jogging and, and missing a note. Oh, and then back to the, the thing of like things that haven't worked, and you change the song to make it work. Yeah, I mean, I think first, my, my first impulse, if I really believe in the song, is to try to perform it really differently, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, there's things where, I'd try it really mean. Try it like, um, like sometimes like fembot, you know, just total, blank like, expression. Um, sit down on the edge of the thing, I stand on the backs of chairs a lot, um, and just ask people to like kill all the house lights, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, does it help if I'm, in an opera box or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then if the song is really broken, I, I'll i try to, but usually I, I'm, I don't know, I think I trust my compass maybe to a fault. And I'm like, I know this song is good, maybe it's just not good live. Let me let me throw the question back at you, Zoe. Have you, when you bring out a new work, have you found things that just, to your mind, just haven't worked? Pretty much every day. Okay. Yeah. And, and when, what is your response to it? Do you alter them or is there a certain well, way to jump to, them? Or? Some of them, I have a couple of songs that I've, that I've kept roughly the same, and then I change them out of just personal boredom, because I get bored with them eventually, um, and uh, I don't, I can't drop out of my own band, so um, <laughs> <laughs> so I have to change the songs to keep myself interested. But other times, um, I'll keep changing it until it works, and then if it doesn't work, then I just think, well, maybe this can't work live. Because I have to do things sequentially, like I have to play a little bit like, you know, there are no jokes in my song, but whatever is like the musical point, I have to achieve it myself incrementally, because I have to play all the parts. And sometimes the audience doesn't have patience to wait for all those parts to be played until I can stack them all up into a song. And so sometimes I have to think about like, well, is there a different way I could execute it, or, you know, it's like a puzzle. That's a good point, because the way, the way your music works, it's not, the song is not, the thing that you're performing is not the, and even the song of the recorded versions are not the destination, it's the journey, it's to, the the journey to the thing. Destination. So the piece is a, yeah. is a, is a time-based piece mm -hmm. uh, that builds itself. Yeah, and sometimes it might be that, like, it's just not interesting enough to take that whole journey, right. and I have to either change it or do something different. When, when actually, this is a question for everybody. When, when you are writing, are, do you have an audience in mind, or is it coming from just a pure place of, of creating? Um, I would like to say it's just a pure place of creating, but I'm a people pleaser. <laughs> and, and the moment that that actually crystallized was when I was on tour with the wonderful Imogen Heap, who you all know. And um, my first tour with her was 2006. And uh, I had just started bringing a, c a computer on stage with me, and it was continually crashing. And um, uh, I had come out of a, you know, a, an environment of playing 20-minute-long free cello odysseys, you know, for the, for a horizontal audience. And um, but her audience, they were all teenagers, and they had like less than 30-second attention spans. And so I had to get them in those first 30 seconds or else they would just be chattering and I would be totally humiliated as her opening act. And so really quickly, I figured out how to do a couple songs where I would just execute things really fast. And, and that became like a fun puzzle. Like, oh, how could I turn this 20 minute long cello jam band of one person into a three minute song? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ben, uh, to the, does the band keep the audience in mind first, last, not at all? I think uh, not at all. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Obsessively <laughs> so. Um, I do think every, you know, there are songs that you write just to be a song, and then you have this moment of you put it in a set and it doesn't work. Or, you know, you can only have so many like mid tempo ballads and some of like. Tell me about it. But like a song that you love. I don't, I, and this is a question for you all, does the way that an audience perceives a song like retroactively affect your perception of that song? And how do you battle against that? I mean, it's the hardest thing in the world, and I, you know, I have songs, because it's, it's a, there's a temptation, when you know you have a, a bunch of songs that work and you know exactly how they work, it's, it's very easy to just rely on those as the tools that you bring out over and over again. And then, there are all these other songs that might have their moments and have their places, but if they don't, you know, if they haven't been thought of in a while, they kind of shrink yeah. and they get smaller and farther and farther away. So it's it's uh, I think it's I don't know it's a, it's a struggle. When I write, when I write, I certainly am not thinking of the audience as an end goal in mind. But but then what what happens is that there are some songs that succeed easily in a live context, and those are the ones I play all the time. And there are other songs that are harder to play, that are a slower burn for people who don't already know them, that are, you know, too down. I mean, I have so many sad songs, and I would love to do like a 90 minute concert of sad songs, but that's like... Yeah. Well, yeah. Sadly, yeah. Wish yeah. 2023, we've been on the back deck with Jonathan Colton, nothing above 80 beats per minute. No, but that's not that's not always the experience that every audience member wants to have. So it's a, it's it's a, you know, and I think that I think that the songwriting for me is a very selfish process, and the performing thing is a very is a much more sort of collaborative thinking about the audience. Our uh, we have the concrete example of that from the concert uh, we just did a couple nights ago. Our song "You Left Me" uh, is sort of thank you. It, that's a great. I love that. I love that song. Yeah, it was it was fun to write. And it was an interesting challenge. But it also works kind of against our audience's expectations because we're a comedy act and you're expecting a certain pace even there. And when we first wrote that song, it was the fun challenge of like, can we do this thing where all of a sudden halfway through the song the metaphor becomes clear and the whole meaning changes. But there's not a lot of jokes in that first minute and a half or so. Yeah. And we would perform it a few times and it would go over okay, but people were just, it felt like people were waiting around for the funny part. And we, it was a kind of a kludge, the introduction that we give, like, the smart audiences get this song, was, you know, it's, it's a bit of a cheat, but it also sets up the audience to realize, okay, well, maybe this song isn't just full of, you know, fart joke, fart joke, fart joke, <laughs> yeah. ta-da. Um, and that's, that, that's one way, you know, the song itself maybe hasn't changed, but our method of presenting it changes a little bit to help it work for the people who are here to see us. I kind of get a perverse thrill out of that kind of thing, though, like that, my song, Millionaire Girlfriend, which, when I do for audiences who don't know me, <laughs> you know, the first verse, like, it doesn't tip its hand until the, until the chorus, and so the whole verse is this really syrupy, treacly, sincere thing about being in love with someone, and it's like this folky, finger-picky thing, and I often see audiences like, all right, and sort of like reaching for their phones. <laughs> But I love it because I know that at some point it's gonna it's gonna like tip over and they're like oh and that is really it's really yeah. and, and, then the thrill. and the challenge is like when you wait that much longer into That's right. a song like that it's got to be real good to yeah. turn the pay off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if anyone has questions, we're gonna feel free to throw the questions. Hi, my name is Rex Anderson. All right. uh, so about fifty years ago, a band that uh, toured quite a bit stopped and went into the studio. And uh, really, the rest of their career was in the studio for the most part until uh, they all broke up into their various parts. Uh, my question is Did you guys have an opportunity to watch the Get Back film? And what was the most surprising things that you saw as songwriters in that process of watching that film? The sheer amount of work. Uh, that He's talking about the Beatles. Yeah, <laughs> little band. But you think of the bands that, that, that are part of your fabric as, oh, they must have just. They must ha be operating this other level, and they are, but that the amount of work that goes into it, where you see just this little seed of an idea, and when first watching that, you hear it and say, oh, they're riffing on their song that is a big hit. It's, oh, no, 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 this is where it starts. 
And then you see it time and again coming back in the ones that are completed, just how much work it is sometimes to get it out. I would add to that, I think there was that clip that was going around on the internet for a while that it was showing like the, the groove from Get Back yeah. like being made. Over two minutes, yeah. Yeah, and I loved seeing that on camera because you know, every time I've ever played with a band, like you're, you know, somebody's got an idea and it takes some time and you, you riff on it and hopefully you're lucky enough that something like that would come out. But it, that thing of them being so comfortable with each other that they can be vulnerable enough to, enough to have like the two hours that that didn't work that yeah, isn't yeah. on camera, you know, I think that sort of vulnerability and comfortableness, like that was really great to see. Yeah, and it's exciting to watch that show because you already know the ending of like, he's sitting there noodling around at the end of two and a half minutes, he's got the, all the bones of get back. Yeah. But you don't know that during the process, so you're just sitting around for two hours just messing with stuff and hoping it's good. Yeah, but. I love that bit. That was like, you know, it's not always just like amazing inspiration and genius. Sometimes it's just like being comfortable with your mates and you can like riff on something and keep building on it. Yeah, that was cool. The other part I want to put on that, like being in a three-piece band, the amount of like bickering and brotherly, like <laughs> levels of like annoyance and whatever, and the, and the jostling that they're doing was both like disconcerting and comforting at the same time. Like, okay, everyone does this. There's you get into this like circular language when you've spent you know your entire adult life with the same people working at a common goal, and you don't know how you got there really. Um, but it's both that and the work that they were doing and how good it was. And I was, I mean, for me, it was how quickly that happened. Yeah. Like those melodies are just on the tip of Paul's tongue seemingly all the time. Which is like, everything he does is like, I don't know, magic to me. Yeah, I, I found, uh, I really enjoyed it, but I also had a lot of anxiety because they wasted so much time. <laughs> <laughs> they had a deadline that was coming up really soon. They were just messing around. <laughs> money, money flowing out. Oh my God, they'd be so nervous. <laughs> Uh, Will they make it in time? I know, I won't. I haven't seen it yet, so no spoilers. Okay. <laughs> don't tell her how the rooftop concert turns out. Uh, another question? Oh, hi. I'll just be short okay. for now. Um, I know the last couple years for myself and some of my other songwriter friends has been creatively rough. That's a, a slight understatement. Um, regardless of whether this time felt really productive for you or not, I would love for everybody to talk about like how you address times of creative lull and how you take care of yourself and also like rekindle that. Feeling. A lot of crying. A lot of crying. <laughs> Me too. Boy. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I had a terrible time these last two years. I haven't been able to really get a lot of creative work done uh, because I'm just not, I just not have not been in a, like a safe emotional space or something. I don't know, I can't even describe it. Um, uh, but, you know, I've had, I've had periods in the past where it was hard to write for whatever reason, and I always like to give that space and sort of honor that. Um, uh, it's a, it's, there's a bit of a duality, because on the one hand, I do want to honor that and say, like, all right, sometimes the field needs to lie fallow for a little while, and you need to be okay with that, and you can do other things and wait for something to come along. But then there comes a certain point where I think it is really constructive. I mean, it's boring, but because it's totally true, it's really constructive to just show up every day and and write something or just play something for 20 minutes, you know? And I find that when I'm stuck in that place and I've let it sit for a while, and I'm like, no, I really want to get back to it. The only way to get back to it is to is to do that thing where I'm like, I'm not gonna write a song today, but I am gonna sit and play for 20 minutes and see what happens. And more often than not, some idea percolates to the surface and, and it goes from there. Let me, oh, I was gonna throw to the rest of the panel actually. Do you all have, say, a, a schedule or a time or a place uh, or any you know process for writing? It was an everyday thing or this much per week or you sort of, as the muse takes you, do you have any particular personal system for yourself? I have a, I have this elementary school schedule that I work on. <laughs> you know, so like, um, and which was totally disrupted by the pandemic. So, you know, my son goes off to school and I try to have certain days that are admin days and then some days where I am, I am a composer and I'm going into the studio even if it is only to organize my cables, you know? 
It's like I have to be in there, and I, I don't have any internet in there. So, um, but I do find that that helps. And you know, my pandemic was divided between the horror of like, how do I be a composer while also being a full stay-at-home pandemic parent, and then the other half of when I was a film composer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I had like a big period of like this identity crisis and trying to figure out how to. That the only way through is to separate your identity from like I am a composer, because if you do that, that's a sure way to beat yourself up. Because if you're if you're not composing, and then the second half of doing a lot of composing, and and Dessa, do you have any like a schedule at all or process? I mean, you know, the the past year and a half, notwithstanding, like I spent a lot of time on the road, which um, and, and in a van, to be clear, like there's a real big difference between when you're making enough money to tour in a van, making enough money to tour in a bus, it's counterintuitive how much of a difference of your life makes because you become diurnal again. Because if you make enough money to travel in a bus, you travel at night, which means that you wake up in a city and you get to spend your life in that city. If you travel in a van, it means you drive during the day, right? So you really are like, you're a commuter with a really intense schedule, you know, where it's like you drive eight hours a day to your one and a half hour a day job. Um, so that kind of schedule for me anyway, it, I, I'm not disciplined enough to have like a really great writing schedule. And also I feel like a lot of people who write when they're on the road, like that third album was all about like, we're in the van and van calling, <laughs> white lies, da, 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 like, you know, like a couple of those go a long way. You don't need a record full of them. Um, but, but I will say that not being, you know, a Paul with a melody, like, constantly, you know, available to be plucked from the ether, that um, when a good turn of phrase does come, or, or I eavesdrop it, you know, um, I try to be disciplined enough, even if it's, like, low-key, socially rude, to say, excuse me for a moment, and it looks like I'm texting somebody, you know, but I do, I'm texting me, I'm texting myself, whatever that rad turn of phrase was, because I know it's gone, you know, it's lost if I don't, get it down. So I'm trying to be better at that, like, yo, when it happens, lean into that moment, because it happens less frequently than probably all of us would wish. Then, uh, both, so both individually and as a band, I'm, I'm going to ask both for your personal songwriting process, and also, like, you have sort of a rehearsal schedule where, like, we're getting together once a week, or X or Y, or we, just, we get accumulate enough songs, and then we'll get together. I'll answer that one first. We've been a band for 15 years, and have been touring for most of those 15 years, and we barely rehearse. Like if there's a tour or the thing, show is the rehearsal. The show is the rehearsal. Like we'll show up. We'll like like before we you know we we've been apart for like three months. We've all sort of moved around and and we got to rehearsal and we're like playing the set and like we we know these songs. It's hard not to know these songs. But yeah. the problem is you get complacent and then forget lyrics and it falls apart. But um, no, we don't do the rehearsal thing. We get in. We we sort of hyper focus to make an album or hyper focus to get ready for a tour. But. We're not the band that gets together once a week and jams. It's just never been our our mo. Um, but also on that, like you know, I, I can't write on the road either. I can't. I've never written a song on the road. I've barely written a lyric. It's uh, you get into this um, you know self protection mode of how can I like just be a person? You know? <laughs> totally. You have um, to build a shell around. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put on your armor. Yeah. Um, but when I'm so when I'm home, I almost have this like feverish like I have to work. I have to work which also doesn't really work all that well because there's all this extra pressure of I'm home for a week, how do I write a song? Um, but a lot of it is just sort of, of showing up and, and I think, maybe you all relate to this, I think the longer I've been in it, the less often that oh, I'm just at a piano and this magical song happens and 20 minutes later it's done experience, which when, I think when you're young and starting to write, like it happens all the time. It's like, it's this drug, and it's, it's easy and it's there. And it, it still happens, but it, it's rarer and um, you get into this, like, you know, this is my job, this is how I do it, this is how I work, what I need to do, and, and I have a lot of, like, projects that a song has to be written or a thing has to be composed, yeah. Yeah. and that's nice, because that I can sit down and, like, oh, in three days, if I don't turn this in, I'm in trouble, and that's a good feeling. <laughs> Whereas, like, with songwriting, you just sort of, I don't know, I wait, you know, it is the apply right. to chair, but you wait. And what's crazy is that when you, I was going to say the same thing, when you have an assignment and somebody's like, you have to do, do a song like this, I have this, I have the same feeling that I have when I start to write, which is like, uh, it's gonna be him then, then, whatever it is. 
and then I just do it because it has to get done. Yeah. And it's usually pretty good. And then I'm like, why don't I just do that for myself, for my own yeah. songs? Yeah. Well, I find that's the hardest thing, is what should I be writing? And when someone gives you the assignments, yeah. Yeah. at least you know what you're aiming for, and not, okay, here I am, and Jonathan, you were talking about um, that process of just breaking through. And it's like exercise. Like, you know you have to do it, and you've been off of it for a while. And on the, but on, by that third day, look, you get the energy return, and it all comes yeah. back. I keep trying to give myself artificial deadlines because, like, you know, I write film scores, and so those are incredibly effective deadlines yeah. that are, you know, make some good music. But I just can't figure out a way to be so severe with myself. Yeah, I I'm, miss I'm, the deadline. <laughs> I'm a terrible boss of myself. I can't give myself those. I will write a song by Friday, and instead I'm going to go eat ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions? Um, I was wondering if you guys have any like methods to kickstart your creative processes, or like if there's a way that you like you have um, a way to keep it going. Like instead of if, like if you see a wall coming, is there a way to like get over that wall? Mm -hmm. This sounds like a joke answer, but I eat a lot of sugar. Like <laughs> Smarties, the American Smarties, little like like not, sugar not Canadian pill, Smarties, sugar pill, yeah, not Canadian Smarties, which are fine. <laughs> But no, it's not a chocolate thing. Like I need, I just like eat sweet tarts or Smarties or a handful of peanut M and M's. Like sometimes that's sort of the thing I need to power me through a a lull. Yeah, it's not two a, cups of coffee. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually it's a great, it's silly, but it actually does change your brain. I'll I'll play something that I know and know and really like, and that can re-energize the part of the brain that goes, oh, that's cool. Sometimes for writing, like when I'm feel like if I'm feeling like the the editorial voice is in my head too early in the process. I'm already like halfway done with something and kind of thinking how is this going to play or what are people going to think, which I think is too soon to welcome that voice in. Sometimes I'll just play a rap song um, that I really like and I would just rap over it with my own lyrics. And for some reason, just the pressure's off. This doesn't count. Right, right. Do you know what I mean? Like this is just for practice. This is just for fun. And so in some way, like doing something that I know won't be committed to tape in the same way. I mean, I'll, I, get my, I get my sweet 17 and a half bar that I can take back to my song. <laughs> John Flansburg has a technique that I love, which is uh, from They Might Giants, uh, which is that he, he turns on the recorder and he sits with a guitar. And the rule is, write a song for 15 minutes and then stop. And then write a new song for 15 minutes and then stop with that song and then write it and do that for two hours. And at the end of it, you will have eight ideas that are maybe good or maybe bad, but you've also gone through the process of starting a thing and then not worrying about finishing it eight times. And it's a really nice, like, it sort of loosens up all these muscles in this really great way. I, I have a very specific one, which is that often for me, I'll have too many ideas in one song and I need to remove a bunch of them in order to make the song successful. And what I do is I play the song on the crappiest speaker that I have. So I go downstairs and I have this like little kind of like bad old, you know, sound system. And I, you know, the, and I plug the song through that and then I hear the song for what it is, you know, because it compresses it so badly that you hear the gist. Yeah. And that sometimes tells me what I need to take away to make it reveal itself. So. Do, do any of you, oh, sorry. I was just going to say write something stupid. Like write something that's objectively bad and don't worry about it. And it sort of unlocks a part of your brain that's censoring and, and editorializing. It's just like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like take the pressure away and then maybe you get to something great, maybe not, but either way, similarly, at least you're writing. Do any of you have, for lyrics or music, do you, do you keep either like a journal of, of rhymes or an idea or a concept or a musical hook that you sort of keep in the back? backpack somewhere and sort of pull from that. My entire that. iPhone is full of voice memos because yes. I always come up with things while I'm walking and I'm singing yeah. you know, and I'm like, oh, this is amazing, this is incredible, and then I never listen to them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or I do listen to them, I can't find the one. It's like, well, the trumpets go, ah, da, da, da. no, well, they don't go, ah, they go, ah, da, 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 da. Well, 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 like, <laughs> it's like, oh, it's you're like a woman in need of a neurologist. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. just, what is this? What I find that's how you know they're the good ones, because I record them, but the one that gets caught in your head, like, yeah. that's the winner. But for like, so I keep on my on my phone, I guess, you know, since phone era, like I keep like four notes documents that all end in RM, rough materials, so like song rough material, screenplay rough material, poetry rough material, prose rough material, and just like do, you know, when an idea comes, quick class it, and then put it there. 
But yeah, I would say, like, when you said that the, the heartbreak was to have, like, this great line that didn't go anywhere, I mean, like, do you have, like, an invisible knapsack of, like, punchlines that, that you finally get to place and say, yeah. yes, <laughs> that was my sister after five years of carrying around? You're uh, nodding really politely, but I don't know if that's your answer. Also, I didn't hear the question. Wow. <laughs> no, 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 I heard the comment, but I didn't hear the microphone. When you have the yeah. yeah. songs that don't go anywhere, yes. you sort of keep it in the back in pocket and eventually get to insert that rhyme well, yeah, or that yeah, joke. Yeah, somewhere. I made a click sound in, a, in agreement. Okay, yeah. I like that they're in an invisible backpack. It's like, it's like a Wonder Woman's invisible backpack. Mine's a bindle on a stick. <laughs> Mine's a junk drawer, you know, you're looking for the garlic press, but you get the skewer instead, and you say, screw it, I'm making kebabs. <laughs> Go ahead, next question. Uh, so some of you were talking about how it's difficult to keep to solve the first deadlines. Uh, I don't know if you know, there's this guy named Jonathan Bolton who did a thing a week project for a year. <laughs> I don't know how to, to find him. To be <laughs> fair, that was an external de it was a personal deadline, but he made an external by promising the internet, I'm yeah. going to yep. put this thing out once a week. As it was loud. Yep. <laughs> wow. But yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, that was, what the hell were you thinking? Well, I don't know, man. I mean, I, you know, I went back, I went back, uh, I think like five years after I did that, I went back and sort of did a, did a like, a weekly blog where I would listen to the song that I had written five years ago that week and read what I had written about it and then wrote again and I was struck by how how difficult an emotional journey it was like it was and when at the time I was like we this is fun I'm writing songs and then the five years later version was like man I was so depressed <laughs> at this point I was so frustrated by you know I just had three weeks of and none of those songs were good and I had no I don't know I remember writing this song and I had no idea I had to do this thing, and I didn't like how it came out, and I was really bummed out. So it was, it was a real, it was a real struggle, and I wish I could say that it cured me of all of my, all of my blockages, but it did not do a damn thing. <laughs> so you talked earlier about uh, managing getting started, but uh, when you have ideas that aren't working, do, do you have like? a place where you set aside things to come back to later? Uh, and if so, how do you manage that like storage? So there's a lot of half-filled Google Docs. And half-completed or quarter-completed. It's the, the trucks and cars on block, um, blocks in the front and backyard. Yeah, they're all over, scattered. I also feel like you do this with the best intentions. You write a song and you, you have this initial idea that this is the most magical thing ever. It doesn't work. You think, I'll well, come back to it. and. I don't know, one out of 50 times in my experience, if we, I ever go back to it. When it happens, it's awesome. And uh, if we have a, a song on our, a, this is record number six, that we had before our first record, that we finally rehashed. Wow. But that does not happen. This, yeah. is, this is one in 15 years. So um, usually they just go away, and that's okay. And there's this you know, graveyard of, of forgotten songs, but uh, it's just part of the process, I guess. Yeah, I'd agree that like it doesn't feel as problematic to me. Unless you really know like this one has promise and it's really grating on you that it's not complete. I think it, some songwriters, when they're, let's say they're making an album, some people record 25 songs, then pick their whatever, 13 best. I think some people, they'll pull the plug earlier. It's like, okay, I recorded the demo, this one isn't gonna make it, it's not viable, I'm bailing. Or I recorded the first version, the first chorus, this one isn't that tight. So a lot of times I think it's just kind of like the natural, Darwinian songwriting process work. Yeah, I agree with that. I have whole drives of like, uh, you know, things that never made it to the album, or actually full albums that I just didn't finish, and that's just how it is. And maybe they'll resurrect some of them, but probably not. Yeah, I've used I've used pieces of those lost things. Yeah. Uh, you know, there will be a, a chord change that I like, or a, or a little melody snippet. You know, I can think of things where like I started to write a song and it didn't go, and then. Later, I was writing a song, and I needed like a B section, and oh, I kind of like that piece. How does that work in here? And that's that's one of my favorite parts of the songwriting process is the actual construction. Like once you have a sort of skeleton, and you can actually start putting the pieces together and refining them and smoothing things. Like that is my that is the most enjoyable part of it for me because it's past the difficult like inspiration and self-loathing and like 
you know, get, getting through that level of trusting yourself to make something good. And once you have it up on its feet, I just love the, the tinkering and the massaging and the, and the fixing. That's my favorite part. Um, for all the lyricists up here, do you handwrite? Do you type or write on key? Do you have a preference? Uh, uh, for for um, writing, type, because cut and paste and delete. Um, but for recording, because at least for rap verses, because it happens at speed and very often like a song is way better after the first tour of it because you just wrote the, like you're figuring out when to inhale, you know? And so inhaling is a really big part of trying to figure out, um, yeah, both recording and live performance for sure. Hence, you know, like with Aviva and Joshua on stage, like, you know, that hyping in rap land is when, you know, the, the lead usually takes a second and everyone else goes, and then, I, you know, those, those hypes are designed for oxygen intake, you know. Um, and so I'll try to handwrite before I go into the studio sometimes because it's just like the last layer of like committing it to total memory. Yeah, there's a romanticism to writing it, and I think I, I want in my brain to always be writing. And it like just depends. If, if it's happening fast and it's like little ideas and, and, and structural stuff, I'll handwrite if I'm sitting at the piano. But when it comes time to do the, the work, it's always get it onto a document and chop it up and copy and paste. And it um, unless there are any more quick questions, that's about all the time we have. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists Zoe, Jonathan, and Dessa. Personally, I tend to not, we don't finish a lot of songs that we don't bring forward. We will abandon a song. We'll know if it, we'll yeah. mostly know if it's good or not during the process. And rather than finish it and throw it out, we'll just move on to something else. Or determine that this isn't a full song. This is a 30 second bit. Yeah, we do have that, we have that luxury that we can just do a bit or do like a one sentence thing or something. But I also write stuff that, that isn't funny necessarily and that ratio is nearly as good. It's probably 20 or 25 to 1. I'd say like 1 out of 10 ideas and then maybe 1 out of 2 or 3 finished songs ever make it out into the world. Um, I'd say that usually I do pull the plug before a song is done, so most of them like get full written, get recorded. But as far as performance, I'm a little gun shy. I'm a little cautious maybe in constructing set lists, and I'm kind of scared to do the slow ones, you know? So probably one out of every three, one out of every four would have any kind of regular rotation. Yeah, I definitely feel like I, I, I use every part of the buffalo. I, like, I, <laughs> I, if, I, uh, if I can manage to finish a song, it usually means it's... I've, I've judged it good enough to actually record at least, you know, whether or not it makes it into the frequent rotation live is sort of a different different measure. But yeah, I kind of I songs for me kind of peter out if I don't if I'm not into them and then I just don't finish them. Some, some of my songs I, I can't actually play live anymore or so and I change them anyway, so they're only sometimes tangentially related to the originals. But so I would say yeah, I would say there's like some maybe le way less than half. I play live, and then as for what I write, I think less than a quarter of the songs that I write actually make it somewhere. You know. <laughs> is that is there two more questions there? Or are you, oh, okay, so one more question. Great. When you guys finish your piece, do you learn it by your families, and how do they receive it? Oh, interesting question. I have. Yeah, I wrote some legally sensitive stuff. Um, run it, run it by people, but also once I didn't, and I tried to just change names and pronouns enough. And uh, and was confronted after a show, you know. And to my discredit, I mean, like I did. Obviously, I didn't do enough, you know. Um, but at some point, too, I think, I, you know, that the song Layla is really good. I'm glad it's recorded. That would not have passed muster. You know what I mean? Can I write a song about your wife? It's not going to work. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, uh, I don't play them for my family because their response is generally underwhelming. <laughs> I feel like my mom likes everything, so it's not... <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 
I can't believe your mom. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I run the songs past my family, but like if I feel like we got a really good one going, I might, I might sort of say, I think this one might actually... I, I was uh, writing music for a major video game last year, and um, I did play those for my son because I think he had a better sense of like, yeah, I was like, does this sound like a combat scene? I'd be like, no, it's too mellow. Or like, whereas I would just be like, oh, it's so, you know, I just had no sense of like, that, so. <laughs> yeah. So, no? Okay, there you go. So it sounds like you run all your songs past Ben's mom because yeah. she's the best <laughs> one. She wants to love it. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.